his list of achievements would take up this entire session. So I'm only gonna name a few. He is co-founder of Can't Cancel Pride. He is executive producer of the award-winning short films like Out of the Shadows, The Words Matter, and They Will See You, which earned him his first GLAAD Media Award nomination this year. He was also behind the first ever commercial to showcase the pride flag on air with Pantene's beautiful LGBTQ plus commercial. Above all, he is a storyteller that understands that brands have the power to tell stories that make for a more empathetic world. He embodies ethos in action, and it is absolutely my privilege to be able to host this chat with you today. Gosh, well, thanks for that warm welcome. Um, it's really great to be here with all of you. Um, it's thrilling to see a day dedicated to conversations on this topic, because I think it's probably one of the most dynamic areas, um, not just in inclusive marketing, but really in all of marketing today. Um, it's something that, you know, it continues to evolve. So thank you for dedicating the time to do it. And thanks for asking me to be here. Fred, I, I would like to quickly set the stage for our conversation and then get right into the questions. So the recognition of the LGBTQ plus community in marketing may be relatively new to the mainstream discourse. However, diverse identities have always existed and are here to stay. LGBT consumers now represent over $1 trillion of buying power. And we can all agree that businesses should not integrate LGBTQ plus marketing framework into their communications because it's a trend, but rather because it is a valuable perspective to align with values of visibility, equity, and representation. I know that today much of our conversation will revolve around these themes. But I'd like to begin by asking you to take a step back before you give us tactical insights and tell us about your strategy. I'd love to begin by asking you about your personal why. What drives you to care so deeply about the LGBTQ plus community having proper representation and marketing? Well, it's, I think it's really interesting because when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, I never saw myself represented. Um, I don't think that I know, I, I don't think that I knew I didn't see myself represented, um, but I knew I felt outside. I knew that I felt different and um, I never saw role models that I could identify with. And I think it was very difficult to not see yourself reflected in the world, even if you can't define what that might be. Um, and, you know, as brand builders, as marketers, as advertisers, we have an incredibly powerful voice. And with that voice comes an incredible amount of privilege to reflect humanity. And when I, you know, when I first started with PNG and I was first out, uh, we would begin having discussions about LGBTQ representation, LGBTQ marketing. And I was often told, well, that's not our target. You know, we, we're really focused over here. We're focused over here. And in the few times that we were able to have LGBTQ representation, I found myself being so thankful, almost effusively thankful to the people that did it. And I started to question, why am I being so thankful for you putting me in the same place that you're putting everybody else? And it started to, uh, started to help me realize that I had a voice and other LGBTQ people had voices within these companies to affect change so that other people could see themselves. And when we first started to do it, the letters that we would get back in the, in the emails or the social media outreach that we would, re, we would get back from people that had seen it what had a profound impact on me. I remember when we, um, when we were working with Gus Kenworthy in the, for the Winter Games in 2018, one young man wrote um, and shared his experience and in that experience. Thank you so much, Brent, so beautiful. I think one of the most interesting aspects for me um, is how honest PNG has been about the roots of a lot of their work in marketing translating directly from internal work that had to be done that was led by the employees. Can you share a little bit more about that and how you've been able to translate that purpose into a proper business practice? Sure. Well, I think what became very apparent to us is that we had to be honest about our past and our journey in our relationship with LBT, LGBTQ consumers, LGBTQ employees to help build the strategies that we are, we are now putting into place 
So for us, we went back. Um, we we worked with our first out employee who retired from PNG about 20 years ago. Um, we worked to understand his story, what his experience was, and then we began to tell that story. And we 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 told that story not only to demonstrate how far we've come, um, but also to learn the lessons what all those generations of people that came before us had worked to work to achieve. And so we could put that into practice. Um, and it helped shape the pride that people had within the company for what we had done. It helped us in a way to acknowledge the, the, the mistakes of our past so that you know, we can grow. And then it also helped translate into that, that into a conversation that we could have outside the company about what, what different companies can be doing. And then therefore what brands can be doing to help shape LGBTQ equality in their communities. Love it, that falls right into my next thought. Um, would love to hear more about the work that you were doing with GLAD as part of a broader P&G partnership. Sure, so I think GLAD has been an essential uh, partner for us because of their, their work in helping us shape the best policies and practices when we're, when, you know, when we're incorporating um, LGBTQ representation and inclusion. So we're working with them today um, to study the myths and the barriers that companies um, are facing in order to drive more LGBTQ inclusion in advertising. Uh, the Gina Davis Institute found this year that only 1.8% of ads contain LGBTQ representation um, when you're able to you know, discern sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and so that number is drastically low. So we know that there is something holding people back, holding companies back from putting in really outstanding campaigns, really outstanding representation. And so GLAD and PNG are partnering together in order to help address this. We'll be announcing more later this spring, but our hope is that we're able to build a coalition of companies that are gonna help address this and help raise that number responsibly up from 1.8% so that people can see themselves represented in the world and that we're doing it in a way that is not shortcutting, not stereotyping, or not doing something that's like a bolted on effort that doesn't have really a chance to have a sustained campaign or a sustained commitment to the community. That sounds really amazing and I can't wait for you to tell us more about it when it's time and to see if we can get involved. That sounds great. Um, Brent, I'd love for you to now give us a little bit of your personal tactical and strategy approaches and uh, specifically when it comes to what are some key do's and don'ts as you're talking to the LGBTQ plus community. Well, I think the first, uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, the first thing that I think is absolutely inherent is that it's part of a ongoing strategy, but it's part of the strategy of your brand framework something that's not bolted on, but it's inherent to what you're doing um, and your sustained commitment, as I, as I just mentioned. I think for a long time, what we saw is that LGBTQ campaigns were driven by the passion of one employee or somebody sitting in a chair at the time who may come, pri come time for pride. And they would see their, that that was their window in. That was their, their kind of way to step into the LGBTQ community, but it wasn't something that they could sustain. And so what we are working with all of our brands now, it's kind of like a, it's a basically like a four prong approach is first of all, clearly articulating your brand mission and then looking at your brand benefit. And then what is the human insight that you're bringing to, bringing to life from that? And then what is the LGBTQ lens over that human insight? Because once we get to that, that, that formula and get to that model, we're able to get something that is part of an ongoing plan that doesn't need to leave at one time of the year, that doesn't need to just be a, like a one-off execution, but helps to further the way that the, the, the people are interacting with your brand. Like I'll give you an example. So uh, Gillette introduced a, an, an ad in a campaign a little over a year ago called First Shave that looked at a transgender man of color shaving for the first time. And it was just really interesting because it hit on this insight that for shaving, no matter who you are, no matter what walk of life you come from, shaving is an important rite of passage in your life. But when you put a lens of a transgender man onto that insight, a transgender man shaving for the first time is a whole different level of rite of passage. It may be something that they never thought would be possible. It may be part of their transition process that is a massive milestone but it's something that, that the general population or the non-LGBTQ market or the non-transgender market can relate to. So 
by by bringing that in, it helped lift up Gillette's overall mission, and and it and it and their product was still at the center of it, but it became relatable, and it was something that people could identify with. But they had to do the work to to dig deep and understand the consumer, understand the barriers that existed with the transgender community, and then put that into a campaign construct that had real viability and real relatability. And so that's what we're trying to do all the time. Um, and if you can achieve that at the foundational level of your brand strategy, you're going to have something that can have long-term growth potential for the business, which is ultimately the key to sustaining the campaign, that, those campaigns. That is such a wonderful example. I can really see just all the dots connecting and it really crystallized like best practices. Thank you for that, Brent. Um, you're also the co-founder of Can't Cancel Pride. It's a fantastic initiative, and I'd love for you to tell us a bit more about that. Well, last year, when um, it became you know very apparent that COVID-19 was going to have um, a disproportionate impact on a lot of communities, we were looking at how can we support the LGBTQ community. And of course, there are a couple of different things happening all at the same time, right? The first of all, pride celebrations around the world are being canceled, and I think the, the, the window of visibility that pride gives to so many people is so critical because if you, even if you're not in a large city, pride still gives people um, a window into a world or into a community that says there are people out there like me. And um, when you cut off that lifeline from people, um, it can often mean um, feelings of you know, much more increased isolation. Um, you can cut off from um, support from chosen family, friends, et cetera, whoever it might be that are part of your community. And that's what a lot of the LGBT community was experiencing through COVID, not only through loss of livelihood, through you know, a host of different things. There was a real element to identity that was being impacted. And we wanted to do what, you know, use our voice as a leading advertiser and use the privilege that we have to help address that loss of visibility. So we wanted to also create a platform that brands could come into safely and be part of the conversation, be part of it in a meaningful way and generate support for the community that wasn't seen as rainbow washing, that wasn't seen as being gratuitous. So we created Can't Cancel Pride as a way to bring the entertainment community and brands together in order to raise money for a host of different LGBTQ organizations. So we were able to raise $4 million for um, these organizations through the work of brands and bring that to consumers, you know, millions and millions of people that were having trouble seeing themselves seen in the world. So hopefully we can create this as a long-term viable platform um, so brands can enter into the LGBTQ conversation and do it in a responsible way. Um, and then hopefully we get those brands to sustain that conversation over time. I always say that, um, you know, uh, pride, every pride is someone's first pride. I think we, we've talked about that before. Uh, one of my and, favorite friend quotes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it, I think it's really true. And pride is an entry point for a lot of people. Um, so whether it be a young LGBTQ person that goes to their first pride, whether it be a brand that decides, you know what, we want to support the LGBTQ community. So we're going to enter in with our first pride conversation. We want to make that a valuable experience for everybody so that they make that a lifelong commitment or a brand like an extended brand commitment. And that's the opportunity that pride can give us. It's a way to open the door to more people um, to create more visibility, but do it responsibly um, focus on the accurate and authentic portrayal of the community and do it in a way that isn't self-serving, but is it about a sustained model? I love that. It's, there's so much conversation around. We could even, that topic could take up a yeah. lot more of this convo, but I, I think it's so important to just acknowledge that not, you know, there, there's sometimes a negative conversation about, of course, pride and rainbow washing, but I do love that other perspective to it. Um, and later on, we'll talk a little bit about what makes a good ally. But I love that you are counterbalancing that conversation right now with meaningful, thoughtful advice, because it is important to realize that for some, it, for some, it is a first point of contact. It is an entryway into um, almost welcome that it is, is important. So thank you. Um, yeah, and I think the I think there's an interesting point on that. I think there's 
we see a lot of brands come in there that do it poorly or do it kind of co in half. And I think what we have to be careful that we not do is overly shame the brands that are coming in with good intent that may not be doing it um, um, super effectively, but make sure that we are creating conversation and giving people tools, whether they be our brands or another brand that um, brings them along and, and helps them grow in that process. Um, I think there will always be some that come in with malintent or being overly opportunistic and certainly they deserve to um, uh, have people be critical of them. But more, more than anything, we need to be inviting people in and helping them do that responsibly. And so the, one of the things that we often talk about um, like something we call the four R's of, of how, we, how we work with our brands in these spaces. I mean, the first one is reach. Now, are you reaching the community? Are you reaching them in, in media outlets and supporting media outlets that either LGBTQ owned or um, are relevant to the, the um, audience? Because the, if they're not seeing what you're saying, it doesn't really matter what you're saying because it's kind of falling out into this, this, this ecosystem um, and, and, and not being heard. Um, the second thing we talk about is representation. And are you, know, are you accurately and authentically representing the community? And the diversity of the community can make that a real challenge, but the insights across the community are often fairly common. And so are you getting the insight right and bringing that to life through the right voices? And are you doing that in a, in a diverse and responsible way? And are the people working in your teams representing the community? Are your agencies representative of the community? Because that's where you get the insights. And then we talk about resonance. Um, does the, the does the or the does the campaigns that you're doing does it does it is it lifting up an issue? Is it lifting up the community in a way that is um, uh, creating long-term conversation, um, creating um, long-term solution, um, or is it just a, a bit of a one-off or um, doesn't fully respect the traditions and and um, the practices of what the LGBT community represents. And the last one is really relevancy. You know, what's the relevancy of your insight? I mean, it's very easy to put an LGBTQ person in a campaign, right? But they may not be representing something that, that, that recognizes a challenge or an experience or, or something that truly communicates the fabric of our culture. And if you're not using that and doing that all responsibly, you can end up reinforcing stereotype. You can end up act, act with good intent, um, having a negative impact on the way people are seeing the community because you haven't fully done the strategic work necessary to bring that forward so that perhaps a non-LGBTQ person sees that um, and, and doesn't fully understand the communication. So you may be reinforcing something negative or you just miss an opportunity to help bring them along in the conversation that you're working to create. Wow, so, I mean, that was so helpful. I think gold for so many marketers right now. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I do wanna build on that question and just ask you, so how, given the importance of pride and not taking anything from that and, and really piggybacking on our, on our comments, how do we build on pride, but, build moments that are year round communications and not get stuck into this rut of just celebrating um, the LGBT community one time a year. I mean, I, I know that in general, this is something that is not a best practice. Um, and I would love to just hear your perspective on the best approach. I, I think it really goes back into the strength of your insight. Um, a couple of years ago, we started working really closely with Pantene and going deep on, um, on their relationship with the LGBTQ consumer. We found that 60% of LGBTQ people change their hair when they come out of the closet. And so that led us into a really interesting relationship between LGBTQ people and their hair that al allowed us to discover that hair is the number one form of identity and expression that people are choosing to represent how they want to be seen by the world. And so that became, a, that's, a, that's not a pride idea. That is a brand idea that can be sustained throughout the year. And I wanted to share just one way we brought that to life in Europe 
um, through um, a host of uh, transgender people to, that shared their experience. And so we created this campaign called Hair Has No Gender, uh, of which we're in the second year now. Um, and one, would love to share that video if we have that to queue up. I believe we can queue that up now. And great. already the questions are starting to come. Oh, great. <laughs> I grew up being told that people like me were ugly, that we were perverts. Um, and I know that when I first transitioned, um, I, I didn't used to go to the house for weeks at a time because I was so ashamed. When I was young, that focused on you know transgender women, I still can understand the, the idea of putting yourself authentically out into the world. And so we can lift up those conversations, but we do it, we do it with an insight that helps other people better understand those areas of the community that may, they may never have interacted with before. Um, and that is how you create conversation. And that's how you bring more people into the fold uh, it's done in a very non-political way. There's nothing political about those statements. They're statements about humanity. And I think at the end of the day, that's why they work. Absolutely. I have another one here for you from Andres Gutierrez. Many companies have started ERGs in recent years. What do you think should be the role of these ERGs within each company to take it beyond creating this internal community? Would love your opinion because oftentimes we are challenged with how to keep these ERGs active in our companies at wider than just Pride Month. Right, it's a really good point. And we've, we've broadened our, our, our um, uh, equality and inclusion strategies to be four pillars, employees, which were the ERGs fit, then brand capability, then our business partners and suppliers, and the fourth is community. And so we work across all of those different functions to help drive LGBTQ equality. And then we figure out from the ERGs where our specialists or where people that have those passion areas can plug in so that they become part of the ongoing, ongoing dialogue, not just about attracting and retaining the employees, but how we're building operations across the company in all areas they're gonna move us forward. And that gives us something that's much more in depth and sustained where we can help give people more roles in shaping the future of those conversations. I, I love that. Thank you. I have one of, another one here. What makes brands good aspiring allies? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I think there's a couple of things. And again, I go back to this, this idea of, of insight, right? And knowing what part of the conversation you can be a part of and doing that in a way that is um, sustainable. Like for our brands, for example, we focus on we focus on kind of the movable middle and um, uh, broad human insights told with an LGBTQ lens. Mm. There are other brands out there that are enormously impactful, making broad, big political statements um, that ultimately can shift in a, in a you know very suddenly um, part of the conversation on LGBTQ equality and. When, but when you get it right with your brand voice, that is what has impact because it's sustainable. Um, and I think it's, that ends up making you a good ally. And it's like, not every brand has to be everything to everybody. But the point is you're being responsible in what you're choosing to do and you do it well and you sustain that commitment. We have time for one more. And right. I'm gonna ask you, uh, what is the one book or educational resource that you would recommend everyone should either follow, read, or watch? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I mean, I, I never stop consuming. I think that's the, I mean, I think that's the important part. I think, um, you know, I've gone back and I think I've watched every LGBTQ theme movie that's ever been made. And um, you just keep, I, I, I keep um, looking for more and more and more. I mean, I, I truly think that GLAAD has put out just some incredible guidance mm -hmm. um, and just in some incredible resources to help um, us figure out a lot of the, you know, a lot of the different um, kind of the dark corners that we don't see all the time. Um, so they have some incredible things on their, um, on their website and through um, their media institute that have been enormously helpful. I, I can't put my finger on one um, but I think the point is, is that as you go into this, going and seeking those resources to do your homework and uncover those blind spots, which may unintentionally lead you to some places that you don't necessarily mean to be. 
That's all really helpful, Brian. I think we're up at time. And honestly, I'm I'm not ready because I have a bunch more questions to ask you <laughs> and would love to continue this conversation. I about it all day. I love it. It's been so insightful, so thoughtful. Um, clearly, you, you know, you you really not only have such a true passion and purpose for your work, but it's it's clear that your soul lights up talking about it and you have so much to offer us as marketers that we can learn from. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity today. And thank you for allowing me this privilege of oh, being- it's great. Anytime. I love it. So thank you for having me. Well, I hope everyone-